So I see people are still filtering in, but we can get started with the, uh, the introduction now. Uh, so good morning to all of you. Thank you for joining us for day two of Tipping Point, Connecticut's first affordable housing conference series. Throughout the week, we at the Partnership for Strong Communities are hosting over 30 sessions featuring local, state, and national experts leading conference, uh, con conversations that explore challenges, share best practices, and coalesce us around critical next steps to address key affordable housing issues in our state. My name is Charlie Shaddix, the Communications Manager at the Partnership, and today we are thrilled to bring you a keynote presentation by Jacqueline Rabe Thomas. Jacqueline is the CT Mirror's education and housing reporter and is an original member of the CT Mirror staff joining shortly before the Mirror's 20, January 2010 launch. Her awards include the Theodore A. Driscoll Investigative Award from the Connecticut Society of Professional Journalists in 2019 for reporting on inadequate inmate health care, first place for investigative reporting from the New England Newspaper and Press Association in 2020 for reporting on housing segregation, and two first place awards from the National Education Writers Association in 2012. One in beat reporting for her overall education coverage and one for an investigative series exposing questionable monetary and personnel actions taken by the Board of Regents for Higher Education. She was selected for a prestigious year long ProPublica local reporting grant in 2019 exploring a range of affordable and low income housing issues. As most of you know, Jacqueline's work includes the Separated by Design series on affordable housing and residential segregation in Connecticut. Since then, her work has covered many topics related to housing disparities in Connecticut, and just yesterday she published a piece on racial disparities in home ownership, which I highly recommend you check out. In this presentation, Jacqueline will discuss some of the topics that she covers, including residential segregation and the intersection between housing and education. There will also be a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, before we turn it over to our presenters, we would like to thank uh, our leading sponsors, the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority and the Melville Charitable Trust. Their deep support has been integral for allowing this conference series to exist. Also, we would like to thank our uh, collaborating sponsor, the Connecticut Department of Housing, and our supporting sponsors, Housing Enterprises Incorporated and Whittlesey. A uh, couple of housekeeping notes before we start. The session is being recorded and we will make, we will make all recordings uh, available to conference attendees as soon as possible. You'll get an email after the conference and uh, it'll have a, a link to all the different sessions. All participants have entered muted. Please remain on mute until a presenter has asked you to unmute. Um, if you have a technology issue, please select the chat icon in the Zoom control panel and send it in the chat to our session leader, Chelsea Ross. Uh, you can find her at PSC Zoom meetings. We'll do our best to assist you. Your presenter will let you know how they would like content questions to be submitted. A few minutes before the end of the session, we'll launch a poll that asks for your feedback on the session. Please take a minute to share and help us improve future webinars and conference offerings. Uh, finally, you can join the conversation about Tipping Point on Twitter uh, using the hashtag TippingPoint2020. You can also follow us at tw on Twitter at uh, PSE Housing. If you have, are not following us already, you can also uh, follow Jacqueline at Jacqueline Rabe on Twitter. Lastly, the Partnership of Strong Communities is working to better understand the needs of our communities and affordable housing pa uh, partners. We want to learn from you. Towards the end of the session, we will be sharing a link to a survey in the chat. Please take a few minutes after the session to share your feedback and help shape the, both the issues we work on and the ways that we work. I will now turn it over to Jacqueline to get us started. Hello, can everyone hear me? All right, so I am Jacqueline Rabe Thomas. Thanks for having me today. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, what you're seeing right now is a photo of an eviction or the aftermath of an eviction rather in Hartford. Um, in the background, you'll see the Connecticut Supreme Court um, and on the foreground, you will see all the belongings that were left to the curb. And this is a reality of housing instability for many people. So um, this is in one of Connecticut's most segregated neighborhoods and one of the poorest neighborhoods in the state as well. Hi, Jackie, we're not seeing your screen. Can you do me a favor and just share real quick? Oh, um, you're not seeing my screen. I'm not good at technology, hang on. Um, how about now? Good to go, just start your slideshow and we'll be able to see.
Okay, so that's the neighborhood I was talking about. Um, out of the way. Um, so um, yeah, that's the aftermath of an eviction here in Hartford. And so let's talk about the architecture of segregation in Connecticut. Um, before we do though, let's talk about um, just the facts for a second and what the data show. Um, Connecticut has some of the largest wealth disparities in the US and Connecticut has some of the most segregated metros in the US as well. Here's some um, data to back that, those statements up if you would like to explore that on your own. And so let's talk about how this happens. Um, sometimes it's done with niceties. Sometimes people are more explicit in why they don't allow certain housing in their communities. Um, this is a zoning commission transcript from Oxford, um, a town that has very few affordable housing units in their community and is almost entirely comprised of single family homes. Um, at, a, at a 2014 planning and zoning commission meeting, they started talking about the concerns with parking and the town's first selectman singled out traffic during Cinco de Mayo, didn't mention any other holidays. Um, the town's population is very low in Latino population um, or Mexican population that would be celebrating Cinco de Mayo. Um, and I'm not putting slumlords in Oxford were the comments he gave for not wanting this property. Um, here's Oxford's demographics, um, as well as their makeup of housing in their communities. Connecticut Mirror has compiled a town by town um, view so you can see what's going on in your community as far as the demographics as well as affordable housing in your community. Um, let's talk about Westport for a second because Oxford is not alone. Um, I spent a considerable amount of time last year looking at a property that was not even considered affordable housing um, considered, you know, something that would be deed restricted, restricted for low income residents. This was just something that was trying to get more density in a community um, that had very high housing costs. And um, one of the things that um, was brought up during this hearing was we have a dirt lot and we should um, try to, you know, build on that. And so we're not looking at a, at a tractor and an empty dirt field. In the bottom right corner, you'll see what was before the commissioners um, the, during the second iteration of this developer coming before Westport. Um, this, this land was zoned as of right, meaning someone could build without having to go through a special permit through planning and zoning as of right for four or it was either three or four house, single family homes. Um, when the when the developer first came before them, they wanted 12 homes, um, duplexes mostly. Um, they scaled it back to being nine um, homes. So here, I would just like to play this audio for you, if that's all right. Oopsie. I'm really bad at technology, sorry guys. Jackie, we can't hear it on our end. You cannot hear it? Maybe if I put no. it on the screen? No? Um, all right. Duh. All right, well, I'll just move on then, that's fine. Um, you can, the link's there, so if people want to go back and look, read it on their, or listen to it on their end, they can. Um, now I lost my presentation, sorry. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, and so one of the most blatant things that towns will do to avoid affordable housing, for, affordable housing that is deed restricted um, and reserved for lower income individuals is to purchase the land themselves or negotiate um, another 
purchase from a land trust, from a another private developer. And here in Westport, um, you'll see in 2001 on that the left, there was a property that was eyed for some affordable housing. Um, it was a four acre plot of land right next to an elementary school that today only has 5% um, of the students come from low income families. Um, and the town purchased it instead of allowing it to become affordable housing. They spent $4.2 million for that um, four acre property. Um, right next, right down the street is the Westport Inn. Um, similar thing, the town's first selectman negotiated um, it from being purchased and facilitated a $14.5 million purchase of that property. Um, there's what Westport's demographics. You'll see they do not match the state's demographics um, or its affordable housing imprint. Um, you'll see Westport and Oxford are not alone. Here's Simsbury, a recent example of them purchasing land um, for $6 million to avoid affordable housing in that community. Wilton, same thing. They spent 2.5, or sorry, $2.05 million. Um, they gathered some local funding. Um, you won't be able to hear this either because I'm having audio problems over here, but in Woodbridge, um, there was a similar situation. Um, back in 2009, they purchased a piece of land for $7 million at the time rather than allow affordable housing to be built. Um, that was the explanation that was given at the time was that um, this land is ripe for affordable housing to be constructed here. On the left, you'll see um, that it was the, the location of the town, one of the town's country clubs. Um, and now on the left, you'll see that it's just a vacant lot with overgrown brush. Waterford, similar situation um, where a, this site has been sitting vacant for over a decade, 12 years now. Um, this, they'd rather have this. This is two blocks away from the mall in town, um, across the street from a ball field. It's not heavily residential. Um, rather than allow affordable housing to be built here, they um, put up, the neighbors put up a pipe as well. And so um, you won't be able to hear this as well. Um, I. This, I would highly recommend the audio from this protest um, over the summer and spring um, when there were um, protests going on around the state about the murder of George Floyd. Um, I attended some rallies in predominantly white communities and was really struck by um, Naomi Jones's comments. She's on the left about what it was like growing up um, in a segregated community. Um, I would highly recommend listening to the audio. Um, Weston as well, this happens um, on a regular basis. This is a, this is a poster from another rally at a, at a Black Lives Matter in one of the state's most segregated towns, a town that has 100% single family homes and requires multiple acres to develop anything on. Um, so what does all this mean? So let me just back up for a second. Um, so what does all this mean? Um, and where affordable housing is getting built. In Connecticut, we heavily rely on local zoning. Um, and what that means is the location of affordable housing and um, even naturally occurring affordable housing, meaning more density into communities like that example earlier on in Westport are not being allowed to be built and home prices are going up and uh, boxing out certain people from being able to move into certain communities. And so this is the location of affordable housing um, in Southwest Connecticut. And so um, you'll see in purple are the low income housing tax credits um, that are by and large the largest driver of funding for affordable housing. Um, you'll see green are the public housing um, complexes and you'll see orange are project based vouchers, meaning a section eight voucher, but it's attached to an individual property. Um, somebody does not have the choice to pick up that voucher and move. Um, and so, I'm sure a lot of this audience is aware of redlining. Um, redlining is still going on based on where we are building affordable housing. Um, it's, you can see Fairfield and Bridgeport. It's a very stark comparison. Um, a US Department of Housing and Urban Development study found that in 2015, um, that Connecticut had one of the highest rates of 
low-income housing tax credits being built, built in high poverty areas. Um, so we stand out in the country for, for this practice. And here's Norwalk, here's Southeastern Connecticut. And so why does any of this matter? Um, if you look at this part of the state, um, this is some research that I would highly recommend. It's the Opportunity Atlas, um, some from folks at Harvard. And um, children who grew up in New London, New, sorry, I can't talk, New London, Wyndham, and Norwich are five times more likely to be imprisoned on April 1, 2010 than those, those who grew up one mile, one community over. Um, these children will also make half the income of their peers where they grew up. So segregation has lifelong lasting effects. Um, this atlas, um, you can look up your specific community and there's a, tons of other benchmarks as far as the impacts that segregation have on children. And so let's talk about children and, and what the impacts are on children around the state. So this is Ashana Cunningham, her wife and three children. They live in Bridgeport and they tried very hard to find another place outside of Bridgeport and what was unsuccessful. Um, Ashana is a daycare worker who makes minimum wage, was living paycheck to paycheck, and her car broke down, or sorry, didn't break down, she got into a car accident, and all, all of a sudden, um, one, one, that one piece threw her life into chaos. She was living because she didn't have money to purchase a new car to get to work. Her car, her, the daycare she was working at wasn't on the bus line, um, and so this threw her her into homelessness um, and she found it really hard to get her and her family out of homelessness. This is Ida Lugo. She lives in Hartford and she lives in one of the state's most segregated communities in Connecticut, Frog Hollow, um, a community that 70% of its housing stock is deed restricted for low-income residents. Um, she has a voucher um, and she would be able to move elsewhere. She has a Section 8 um, choice voucher, meaning in theory, she would be able to move elsewhere. But every time she looks, uh, she's not able to find anywhere that will even rent to her um, because of just blatant discrimination or because her voucher wasn't enough. Um, there have been some recent changes to allow for fluctuations in voucher prices and, and to make their purchasing power a little bit heftier um, and in surrounding communities, but it still is proving a barrier. And so meet Crystal Carter. Um, she is, um, a mother who has um, also struggled to find a place to use her housing voucher. I followed her around for about a year and quickly found out that she um, was not coming up with any places that would rent her an apartment except for places that were really subpar living conditions. And um, I don't think anyone on their worst day would want to live in, in some of the places that she could, uh, that her vouch that she was able to find that would actually accept her voucher. Um, she, I, I listened in and followed her for quite a while and um, her landlord after landlord tell her they do not accept housing choice vouchers. That's illegal in Connecticut, um, but that has not stopped people from still saying they won't accept housing vouchers. Um, she actually has a happy ending. Um, she lives in Simsbury now um, and where her kids go to school. Um, and she, um, through the luck of some civil rights attorneys and a landlord who was who took a hit on what he could have otherwise gotten for uh, the house that she moved into. So um, this is Marina Alares um, outside of her apartment um, or her previous apartment. Um, she also got a housing choice voucher, couldn't find anywhere else to use it. And so this isn't just Westport, it's not just Oxford, it's not just any of these communities. Um, in more than three dozen, uh, the, an investigation that I did last year found that more than three dozen Connecticut towns have seen no net gain in affordable housing um, in their communities over the last two decades. Um, in 18 of those towns, it's been 28 years. And so why is this happening? Again, Connecticut leaves it up to local authorities to decide what does and does not get built. Um, there is an affordable housing statute, 830G, that in theory allows people to um, override local zoning decisions, but in practice, you'll find that things go on for years um, before if a town really wants to throw up barriers. Um, look at all the vacant properties from before.
um, that I that I show, showed you earlier that have some have been the wrath of some of those barriers. So why does all this matter? I am an education reporter through and through. And what brought me to this was that year after year, I was reporting on teachers who were just feeling overwhelmed with the needs that were showing up in their classrooms. And um, so that's a picture of a family walking to school in the Frog Hollow neighborhood with a boarded up house. Um, and you'll see that the per pupil spending um, on the right, there's drastic differences in per pupil spending in the state of Connecticut. Connecticut relies on local property taxes more than 48 other states, meaning that the local um, local property taxes from homes like the one pictured there um, are the ones who are fueling funding for, for the schools in those neighborhoods. Um, in Connecticut's 10 highest neighborhoods, high, highest performing neighborhoods rather, um, spending has increased by 44% over the last decade, while it's only increased by 29% in the lowest performing districts. So um, the highest performing districts, which are the wealthiest districts are also outspending. Um, so while spending overall will go is going up in the state of Connecticut, it is not keeping pace with its wealthy neighborhood neighbors. Um, and you can see how that's playing out and whether it's le leveling the playing field. Um, there's a link there. You can see class size, teacher salaries, um, how they play out. You'll see huge disparities there. For example, in kindergarten, the average class size was 23 students. One community over in Fairfield, it was 19. Um, now, an extra four students might not sound like a lot for some people on this call, but if you also don't have a paraprofessional in that class or um, some of the other supports that are necessary, um, it is a lot. And I would encourage you to have four extra four-year-olds in your class as well. Um, so, um, and see how you deal with that an additional four kids that you're responsible for. Um, and New Haven, the kindergarten class size is 24. Um, it, this is across the board for social workers, guidance counselors, reading interventionists, you'll see huge disparities in the just the teaching staff, again, driven by that property tax. And so um, why haven't things changed, it, whether or not the state is leveling the playing field? Um, at the state capitol, you'll see this is a, a cool tool that the Connecticut mayor created a few years ago that will show if um, it, the state has been facing deficit year after year after year, you'll see that if you want to count more for poverty to sort of equalize things better, um, um, the towns below, you'll see which ones will take a hit. Um, and so that is largely why um, there are these huge disparities because at Conne in Connecticut, we don't wanna take money away from any of the districts at the state capitol that's politically more, um, more difficult. And so um, one of the solutions that um, has been long proven has been to um, intervene, identify students who have higher needs, um, who typically come from lower income families, um, have higher needs, um, such as they're English learners, they um, have, they also have um, typically higher rates of special education identification. Um, and so here's a model that has long been proven in Connecticut and across the country of tiered interventions. Um, but the problem is that model is based on only having, having at, at most 20% of the students in your class having high needs. Um, and so the model is broken if you have much more than that. Um, here's just proof that that model works from UConn. Um, here's some of the students that, um, and parents and teachers that I've spoken with over the years, just to sort of talk about um, how, how the, um, funding has impacted their school. Larry McHugh over there on the left, he is a teacher at the local elementary school in Hartford. He was a teacher of the year a few years ago. Um, almost every student in his class was an English learner, um, but he has received no special um, training to educate English learners, um, though he has um, some support in his school from an, a specialist that, he's, that he shares with others and other teachers in the school. Um, so the federal courts on segregation, um, there is a decision that said that, you know, there's not an explicit, explicit protection under the federal constitution to education. Um, you know, everyone's heard of Brown versus Board of Education. I think San Antonio v. Rodriguez is a little less known. Um, and so that's why segregation thrives. Um, 
So this is a graphic that we did a few years ago about segregation thriving in Connecticut. And it's actually gotten worse since Brown versus Board of Ed. Um, and so the state courts, um, here's what they have to go off of um, when it comes to education. Um, it's in our constitution that um, there shall always be state, um, that the General Assembly shall implement this principle through appropriate legislation um, saying that education is a right, but it doesn't have a qualifier as far as the quantify or as far as the quality of that education. So that was what a Supreme Court decision was about. And here was their decision. It is not the function of the courts to create an educational policy or attempt by judicial fiat to eliminate the societal deficiencies that continue to frustrate the state's educational efforts. The state's offerings must be sufficient to enable student who takes advantage of them to become functional member of society. And so this is the result of um, that, of that, um, of the state's efforts is there are huge disparities in our schools and outcomes based on wealth and based on um, segregation. And um, I should add that we do in our state constitution, we're one of the few states that do have a segregation clause as well saying segregation is unconstitutional. Um, it's just not linked to education. And that's it. Hopefully I didn't go too long. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Did I lose everyone? So I think um, I saw uh, one hand raised uh alex knopp in the uh the participants actually i'm seeing a couple of hands raised now um so if you have a question you can uh you can ask it in the q a tab um i'm not sure if you're, you're all seeing that but but after you ask a question in the q a tab or the chat um we could we can see that Sorry, um, I'm really bad at technology. Um, in the Q and A tab. I don't see anything in the Q and A tab. There's nothing there. We, I see two <laughs> attendees with their hands up. I don't know if, if um, Jacqueline, you are okay with me having someone come off mute to ask their question or you prefer them to keep it in the chat box? Oh yeah, that's fine. Take them off. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so it looks like Chris Senecal has a question. Chris, I'm going to um, allow you to unmute. I actually didn't have a question. That was a mistake. <laughs> no, I, um, I did want to, you know, I might as well take the opportunity to thank Jacqueline for all of the amazing work she's been doing on this. Um, the foundation's a proud sponsor of the latest series that they did. Um, and I really do encourage everyone to, to take a look at the article from yesterday. Um, and, you know, I apologize, though. I didn't mean to raise my hand. I, I stink at technology, too, Jacqueline, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Jacqueline, we have a question um, in the uh, question and answer box from Jack. Jacqueline, given your perspective on researching and writing about Connecticut education and housing disparities over the past decade, what, if anything, has surprised you? What has surprised me? That's a really good question. Um, I think, so I did a story that published yesterday about housing disparities just in home ownership. And I think the thing that surprised me the most as I sort of was going down the rabbit hole to starting to do the analysis, it was like, I hope this isn't a waste of time. I hope I find, you know, we have the, the smallest disparity in the country. Um, and it turns out time after time, you know, I go in with sort of an optimistic view of like, seeing what the data is going to show and then turns out we're the worst um, for segregation, for economic inequality um, or disparities, as well as home ownership rates for individuals. And so I think what has continually shocked me is that I keep finding that in sort of every new avenue of that I, that I do research on is that it, it seems to be not just education. Um, it seems to be housing. It seems to be health. It seems to be so, I mean, maybe that shouldn't surprise me at this point, um, but um, yeah. 
Thank you. <clears throat> so another question came in here. Um, what are some reactions you commonly hear from residents in mostly white affluent suburbs about the contrast between their support for diversity and movements like Black Lives Matter and their town's lack of willingness to allow or embrace affordable housing or multifamily options in their town? I think the most common reaction that I get is that it's not happening in my town, that it's, this isn't something that, you know, we embrace diversity. Look, we have an inclusive housing zone. Um, but then when you dig down deeper in a place like Weston or, or Woodbridge, you'll see that the setback requirements or the parking requirements or name the added on requirements that exist in those towns make it financially and not feasible for a lot of developers to even consider developing in there. And it also sort of just sets the tone that there's a lot of barriers for penetration to be able to build in those communities. <laughs> so I think that having those um, sort of, you know, zoning is a very nuanced issue. And so, um, you know, it's easy to explain that you have all these things in place in zoning that require all the um, that, that in theory permit affordable housing to be built, but then when you see the outcome of what, what's happening, there's, there's a deeper story to be told. And so, you know, I have, you know, a random file, I have a, a file on my desktop that shows like, you know, towns and some of the things that have happened in those towns. Um, so, you know, there's a story, you know, I, I know I only shared some stories in some towns, but it's happening in many, many, many towns. So I'm going to take a question from the audience. I see Alex Knopp, you have your hand up. If you still have a question, I'm going to allow you to unmute and offer your question. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, Jackie, excellent presentation. I really admire your work over the years. Thanks. Um, just a small supplemental correction, if I could. In fact, the Connecticut Supreme Court in the first CJF decision did hold that there was a qualitative dimension to the state's constitutional duty on education and it's a qualitative uh, dimension of an adequate education. But the court later found, as you said in your presentation, that we the plaintiffs had failed to prove that the state had not met its duty to provide an adequate education. But that first decision is an important one and leaves the door open in the future to another attempt by uh, plaintiffs to prove that the state is failing to live up to that duty. But otherwise, thank you again for all your terrific work over the years. Yeah, thank you for that that correction. I, I stand corrected. That is absolutely correct that in the, a previous decision that it did have a qualitative measure, um, but that the Supreme Court did say that um, the state was meeting its minimum threshold in order to provide an education um, and that there was some more work to be done. Um, you know, other places around the country have found really innovative ways to try to tackle the issue of inequality in education. Um, in Detroit comes to mind um, this, this idea of access to literacy, because that is a constitutional requirement as well. Um, and so things like access to being able to read so you can vote. Um, so that has been an, a different innovative way. So it'll be interesting to see what people like um, Attorney Knock it, um, come up with to, to move forward. So the next question comes from our own Sean at the partnership. What insights, if any, can you offer on how to persuade regular folks, not advocates, that housing segregation is crippling our state? Um, I think having the, um, the, gra the, the graphic that I showed about the outcomes, um, it was one of the last that, that I showed um, where it shows there's a really strong correlation between educational outcomes and um, town wealth, I think is really compelling. Um, but if you're not a data person, um, spend a half hour listening to an interview with a teacher from an inner city school. Um, about the challenges that they're facing in their classroom. I think that's sort of how I came to this work is by interviewing so many people over the years in the education field and just finding that 
there seemed to be this intractable problem of teachers who really wanted what was best for their kids and parents who wanted what was best for their kids, but sort of this systemic problem of how schools are funded as well as the needs that were showing up in the class. I should note that Connecticut's education funding system is not based on the actual needs of students in the class. It's based on the state of Connecticut picking a random number out of a hat um, as their foundation. I think it's 11,525 per student and then adjusting that for um, what share of your students are various populations. Um, so it's not really based on any sort of foundation of what kids actually need um, to be able to thrive in their schools. <laughs> So the next question is about education, but in this case, it's for uh, volunteer planning and zoning officials. So what do you think can be done in the way of education for those folks to help overcome barriers? Can I say that one more time? <laughs> yes, and you can see I have an assistant today, <laughs> unexpected assistant. Um, so what do you think you can, uh, can be done in the way of education for volunteer planning and zoning officials to help overcome barriers? Yeah, so I've long wanted to do a story about sort of fact versus fiction of what's going on, uh, sort of reasons for affordable housing not to be able to move forward. So one of the most common things that I hear from planning and zoning officials or school people, school board members is that, you know, there's going to be an influx of education or it's going to cause an uptick in enrollment in our schools and our, we, don't, we can't handle that. Um, but the reality is that in many of our suburbs, enrollment is way down. Um, and so when you base that fact versus um, that, sorry, that statement versus fact, um, you quickly see that uh, maybe there is space for more children. Um, there's also research that shows that um, a lot of times when affordable housing is built in communities, it doesn't bring that many more children. Largely, that's because affordable housing is largely, when it's built, is largely restricted for veterans or restricted for el the elderly or restricted to specialized populations to sort of not give families the same opportunities as others would have. Um, and so I think sort of one of the best things that would that could be done for the education of folks would be sort of having fact versus fiction. Another thing that I regularly hear is that open space um, is we, we don't have enough open space in our communities. Um, and so, but if you do like a satellite view of these communities, you'll quickly find that there's a, the town has a lot of open space or has a lot, you know, it, it just having a two acre requirement in town just inherently provides a lot of not technically open space, but does provide a lot of um, less density than other communities. So I think having sort of these, I, I've long wanted to do a story on sort of fact versus fiction of, of the common threads. The, of the other one that I commonly hear is that we have a lot of affordable housing in town that we just don't get credit for on the state's housing appeals list. Um, I think that's one of the most common ones. Um, and so I think that's a really, that's a legitimate argument. I think that there is a lot of affordable housing in places like West Hartford, for example, that does have a lot of duplexes that are aren't deed restricted. Um, but I think that there are a lot of places that don't have duplexes and do require two acres to build on. Um, so there's a fine line between sort of embracing that talking point and it being a reality in your town. Thank you so much. So next we have a pretty uh, multi-part sort of comment and question from Leslie. So I'm going to break it into the first piece is um, you know, a thank you for all your hard work and research, and uh, she wants to share that you're amazing. And a few thoughts. What do you see as the answer to getting more towns to have affordable housing? And she qualifies that with lawsuits, question mark. So what do you think about that, Jackie? Um, so there are several lawsuits that are going on for 830G. Um, there also is one challenging single family zoning down in Woodbridge right now that I think could have potential statewide ramifications. Um, you know, when it comes to whether or not things are going to change through legislation or through um, litigation, I think the reality is that in Connecticut, we have had Democrats controlling the General Assembly for 23 years, um, almost 24, and the governor's mansion for 10. And so the reality is that there has been one party in control who, in theory, has um, been supportive of sort of 
if there was a party to be more supportive of affordable housing and, and housing costs and housing instability and, and eradicating it, I think it would be the Democratic Party. Um, but the reality is that in 2017, I think it was, they made it harder to um, have developments in certain communities and scaled back our state's affordable housing laws. Um, so unfortunately, I mean, I've been told I'm a pessimist before, but I think it is going to take litigation. Um, but who knows, maybe, maybe this is the year. We'll see. Thank you. Next um, sort of related questions from Sheila, or it's a comment really, is that towns aren't actively using 830G um, income certification uh, that the state provides to ensure that the units built are actually being rented to income eligible households at the set aside unit rent level. Um, so I just wanted to offer that comment and see if you had any follow up and also note that uh, Sarah, Sarah in the chat has offered a link to FCCHO Fairfield County um, housing, uh, Center for Housing Opportunities new narrative projects. So they've released a playbook to help shift the narrative. There's also a follow up webinar to that playbook on December 2nd that folks can register for. Um, so thank you, Sarah, for offering that in the chat. But um, I don't know if you have additional 830G comments, uh, Jackie, or um, income eligibility. Um, requirements. Uh, I have not written about that. Um, I'm intrigued uh, now that if they're not, I, I mean, what I have heard about income requirements is that um, it still is pretty higher income individuals because of how income is defined and what's considered low income. It's used regional um, numbers. And so I haven't heard that there's not certification. Um, I know it's part of like the grading system for federal low income housing tax credits and vouchers to certify income thresholds. And there's a certain limit, um, I believe that has to be met or, or maybe bad things happen, I don't know, but I, I have seen it that it's in the um, sort of the, the checks and balance side of things. I don't know how good that is though. Cause like I said, I have not done any research into that, but. It, please email me what you know. Um, and anyone, email me story ideas. I, I, you know, journalists are not scary people. We love hearing from people. Um, that's how stories begin, um, you know. So I, I would encourage everyone to email me at jray.ctmayor.org. So the next question we have is from Maybeth. I, uh, the homes of Black families are consistently devalued. I've been reading a lot about this lately uh, as well. Have you done any research on the subject here in Connecticut and what were your findings? I have not done any research. I should mention that I'm only like a year into this beat. So I'm sorry. I would love to do a story on that. Um, there was a really great story in the New York Times about a owner, someone who owns um, a business here in Hartford and owns a home um, in the suburbs of Hartford and his home being appraised different um, when he had pictures of himself versus just his wife who is white. Um, so I had, and I mean, that's sort of to the point that you were mentioning, uh, but in certain communities, yes, um, being a few blocks apart can make all the difference for what your home is appraised at versus a couple communities over, but I have not looked at it in Connecticut. Again, anything, tips that you think I should be working on on that story, I'd, I'd love to tackle that at some point. Great. I realize we have another hand up in the attendee panel. It looks like Charles Duffy, who also submitted a question. So Charles, I'm going to allow you to talk and um, offer your question and comment. Wait, can you hear me? This is Charlie. You're good, Charlie. Oh, good. Uh, it was just a comment um, about uh, Connecticut. And the fundamental problem was 169 towns, <coughs> excuse me, uh, with separate uh, authority and the lack of the state authority to, uh, well, to have changed things very much. Uh, and it continues to be a problem. As one of the original co-authors of 8-30G, uh, that happened in a quiet way, uh, not as a proposed formal piece of legislation, but an amendment passed by a very small vote in the House and uh, a larger vote in the Senate, but still uh, amendments and changes to that uh, are necessary to get at the fundamental issues, which um, <clears throat> we've all been talking about and, and are all experienced with. Uh, and that means getting to uh, the governor 
and uh, the state legislature to uh, change things. Uh, but it's it's a tough, tough, tough struggle. Um, so it's more of a comment than a question. Thanks, Charlie. So we have a couple of comments slash questions regarding Westport, uh, specifically in the panel, Jackie. So um, someone offered that since 2017, Westport PNZ has approved mul multiple mixed income multifamily projects. Um, and they provide a pretty comprehensive list of some of those project approvals, which I'll make sure you can see. But the question attached is, have you seen a change in Westport or other communities since you started reporting on this issue in towns? Um, and they provided that partial list of approved projects since 2018. Sure, so yes, Westport has approved several um, projects in recent years. Um, I did mention those in my original story um, when I had how many units they've approved in the last, I think since the 830G was passed 30 years ago, um, it's something like 115 units. Um, so I think many people can agree that 115 units um, designated for affordable housing is still really low compared to a town. I think they have, if I'm remembering correctly, something like 11 or 12,000 um, homes in town. Um, and so, you know, and, and by the way, um, several of the properties that they do get credit on the appeals list are for homeless shelters. So they're not permanent long-term um, facilities or homes for people. Um, and so, yes, they have started to move in the right direction in more recent years. The bulk of that 115 or whatever it is um, were in more recent years. You know, if you would have looked there five years ago, it would have been like 10 units. Um, and so, they have started to move in the right direction, um, but there are several properties that they've really just put off limits or efforts that have not moved forward for whatever reason. And so if you look at the percentage of deed restricted affordable housing in their community, it is still very low compared to other places in the state. Um, they did get credit for their recent um, for the recent increase in affordable housing um, from the Department of Housing um, for getting a um, moratorium from people, from developers being able to go around the 830G. But like I mentioned, their, their total number of deed restricted is still very low. Um, I think that answered all the questions, right? On Westport. I think you did a great job. But I should mention also that they have been trying for the last several months to get some changes done um, to allow things like accessory dwellings and to allow for um, a development on a land that is owned by the Department of Transportation presently. Um, and so they have been trying to, that none of those things have crossed the finish line though. All right, I have another attendee with their hand up, Craig Miner. Craig, I'm going to allow you to unmute and ask your question, and I'm going to go back on mute. Nope, sorry, I did not mean to raise my hand. That happens to the best of us. Okay, so I have two questions and comments that I'm going to combine into one. So Leslie's talking about um, institutional racism in our state, right? And um, that some of these housing issues are so directly related to racism and that are sometimes used as either a proxy or an excuse for racism. And Sarah Bronin offered uh, a follow-up to Sean's question and your answer is that people really aren't ready to accept the basic concept of segregation and racial segregation and that land use uh, laws cause that. Um, so she shared some desegregate CT links that I will put in the chat in just a moment, um, which is part of the, the work to debunk the myths that you mentioned around multifamily housing bringing kids. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit more about that sort of myth that multifamily housing <laughs> means more children and how we work to continue to debunk that? Sure. So I think the perfect example around that is in Weston. And so um, I spent a considerable amount of time with an individual there, Brian Murray, um, who is one of the few Black families who lives in town. Um, he rents and um, he also, you know, when after the murder of George Floyd, there was a 
I wouldn't call it a protest. I, would, I wouldn't even call it a rally. It was more, um, it was a very, you know, it was, it was on the town green. It was, you know, it was a very, it was sort of a, a celebration of needing to diversify efforts in town um, and what the town has done so far. And, um, you know, when, when talking with him, he held up a sign in town and I don't have the picture at the top of my head, but he held up a picture of like, you know, we don't have any black teachers in town. We don't have, um, and just sort of called out the town for its fact versus reality. And so when talking with some of the local officials there about why certain projects have never moved forward, um, the one theme that came forward time and time again was we don't have the capacity in our schools. Um, but then you dig deep a little bit deeper and you find out they're actually closing one of their schools in town because of a decline in school enrollment. Um, and then you find out that um, the the decline, I think it was like 9% over the last couple of years, or I actually think it was over five years. Um, and so, you know, that data is readily available. It's online um, and, and it's, you know, EdSite, I think it's edsite.gov. Um, if you Google EdSite, you can see your town's um, trends in enrollment. Um, and so I, I think allowing people to sort of make blanket statements like, you know, we can't afford the capacity in our town, there's real, there's, there's data at your fingertips, but it's sort of fear mongering that, that it's going to lead to increased enrollment in your schools. Um, you know, I should mention that if you look at where there has actually been increased enrollment in our schools, it's Hartford, it's Bridgeport, it's New Haven, the very places that don't exactly have the capacity in their schools to accommodate an increase of students um, necessarily. And so I, I think that's really important to, to point out that um, one of the things that often is the, the the talking point of why affordable housing can't get built in town is that. And like I mentioned earlier, a lot of times affordable housing is not even for families with children. Um, it's it's income, re it's, it's restricted for veterans or it's restricted for the elderly or it's built as a one bedroom. I don't know how many one bedrooms, I don't plan on sharing a bedroom with my two children. Um, so that in, that just by itself, makes it not a family unit. Um, and so there's very few affordable units. If you look at the, the rundown in some of these communities that actually have more than one bedroom um, units that are deed restricted. And the state has started to incentivize that a bit um, when they are building um, different affordable units to have more than just a single bedroom um, in getting more touring points and then et cetera. So the, the state has started to address that need for families and not just the elderly and not just veterans who need um, affordable housing in other communities. So just noting, we have about six minutes left. So I have an additional question to throw to you, but if you have a burning question, take a moment to pop it in the Q&A panel. Um, or if you have, uh, if you want to raise your hand, I'll probably take one or two more questions and then allow Jackie to provide any last words before I launch a feedback poll for you all and um, respect our end time of 1030. So the next question is from Sheila. Are land conservation or land trusts another way to prevent housing and affordability? Yeah, um, so I showed an example in Wilton earlier in this presentation. Um, I think that property, people raised $2 million in order to avoid that property from becoming housing. Um, and so, yeah, it is a way. I don't know how else to describe it. I haven't done a deep dive on the issue, except, you know, it's come up um, regularly in my um, reporting of, oh, that's interesting. It's It was affordable housing or housing just in general with more density. Oh, now it's in the land trust. Um, so I'd love to do a deep dive into the role that land trusts are playing into preventing affordable housing. So anyone who has any research on that in Connecticut I'd, or um, could connect me to folks who do have background in that, I would love it. Thank you, Jackie. All right. So I don't see, oh, uh, Sheila has a follow-up. What's the difference between the two options? I'm sorry, between what two options? Um, I'm trying to get back to her <laughs> initial question, which was, let's see, let me scroll down here, between uh, land conservation and land trusts. Can you talk about the difference between the two? 
I'm sorry. I don't, I don't outside know. Outside of my area of expertise as well. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> All right. Let's see if there's any others that just came in. Okay. Thanks, Sheila. Sheila's forgiving us for not knowing the answer. If I were quick on the Google, I could probably get to it, but. I All right. Now, now, now <laughs> she'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> That's a challenge to a reporter, right? An unanswered question. Perfect. Okay. So um, I just want to thank you so much, Jacqueline, for your time, all of the information. Thank you to everyone who uh, attended for your amazing insight. Thank you for your patience with my now missing two-year-old, which is more trouble than when you can see them. Um, and we really appreciate your time. I'm going to um, put in the chat what our next session of the day is, but it is um, separate and unequal, the interactive effects of housing and education policies on school segregation in Connecticut. So if you wanna stick around to hear more about school segregation and its impact on housing, I will provide the link to register for that session in the chat. Um, we'll ask you for some feedback, but I just wanna give a couple minutes to Jackie to offer any last comments that you have. Um, no, I think I'm good. Thanks everyone for tuning in. I feel really special that everyone thinks they have something to say. Thank you. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much. So I launched the poll. I will quickly get the link for the next session if you want to hang around for it. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much, Jackie. And thank you to everyone.